Uh, again, just little, little logistical stuff before, before starting back to material, and that is that, that for the first chapter with Orion and with the problem set, I'm going to be extremely lenient in, in how I grade that stuff. Just We're all getting familiar with it, including me. Um, one of you, uh, I, I think two of you maybe, have found at least one for sure, one I've got to check. Uh, incorrect answers on Orion, that is, it, it has the answer wrong, so I have to read through all of them. Many of these questions I originate with me, but, but somebody in transcribing them confused which one was right and which one was wrong, which is, eh. So just muddle through, I'll muddle through, we'll, we'll get on to the next chapter. Um, the Orion isn't due until the end of the semester. It will never, you know, it will, it will always be like, I, I don't think I will uh, a, uh, assign reading anymore because it just clutters the, the screen. Just, if you can, read along with us as we go through material. Um, this is in the, from, from the perspective that, that the more times you go through the same stuff, the better it settles. And if the first time you encounter it is when I say it, that's not ideal. What else? The problem set, the first problem set really is due on, on Wednesday. Ideally, you would be able to look at the whole problem set in advance without actually having to answer the questions. I'm working with Wiley on that, too, to see whether that's not possible. It's for you to actually see what the questions look like so that you can plan ahead and even talk to me about them. Don't have to just jump in and take them. It's not a test. It's not meant to be a test. Any questions about book? Yeah. As far as I can tell, right now, you can't look at a question and go on to the next one. You have to answer the question. I don't like that approach. And I will work on doing something about that. But that's, uh, I'm not sure I can do anything between now and Wednesday. I end up writing a lot of code to do things myself when I run into stuff I don't like. It's, uh, it's potentially a bad habit because um, it just chews up all my time. But we'll figure something out. Other questions? OK. So, so where are things where, where I left off? I'm, I'm, in principle, I'm talking about ramps. And I'm, I'm starting off with the simplest of possible ramps, which is a horizontal. It's like a sidewalk. Is, is, it's a, it's a str an extreme case of a ramp. And the issue that I, that I was dealing with toward the end of last time was, was why does the sidewalk support a wagon perfectly? And I think it's worth making sure I, I get I, I get this to you as, as completely as possible. It, time I spend on this now will actually deal, deal with issues that will come up later when I talk about how a spring scale works. Uh, this, this scale you might think is laughably antique because all the scales you ever encounter are electronic these days. They read out to, to five digits or something like that to tell you how many bananas you have and how much you have to pay for them. It turns out they are also spring scales as well. I'll tell you in a second what spring scale means. The difference is that, that instead of reporting with a dial, they're reporting electronically. They're taking advantage of a, of a peculiar type of spring that, that can tell you how much it's distorted. What a spring scale is, and so this is in our future, but I'll say it anyway. A spring scale supports an object using something that is like, that, well, using a spring or something equivalent to a spring. And springs have the peculiar character very well, interesting, useful character, that the more you distort them away from their normal shape, which I will give a name to, it's equilibrium shape, the, the shape to which it goes when you leave it alone, no net forces, the more you distort it, the harder it pushes back on its ends, back toward its equilibrium shape. And you know this from experience. You stretch a spring, it pulls back. You squeeze a spring, it pushes, pushes outward. It's always fighting to go back to its original shape, and the fight gets stronger as you distort it more. Interestingly enough, there are a zillion things in the world that are spring-like. And there are things that are very close to being spring-like, including sidewalks, the surfaces of ramps, just about anything you place objects on. They have an equilibrium shape, and, and if you distort them away from that, they push back. And the more you distort them, the harder they push. So, so far, questions about this idea? So. Uh, a spring scale uses the fact that, that the more you bend something, the harder it pushes, or the harder it pushes, the more it bends to report how hard, far it's bending. What this dial, what that needle is actually doing is it's telling you how hard 
how far its spring has bent or squeezed. And you can see as I push down this, this top, I'm bending the spring more and the needle's moving. Now why, why point all this out? It's because I want to I want to convey to you a, 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 as, uh, as clearly as I can an understanding of that bouncing process, the negotiation I call it, where when you first put the wagon down on the sidewalk, it negotiates until it's settled and the wagon is perfectly supported. Not too much, not too little. Uh, it's the, the negotiation process is essentially invisible on a, on a, on a sidewalk because it all happens very fast involving very small bouncing motion. But if I shift from the sidewalk to sort of a soft sidewalk with a dial to tell you how much the sidewalk is distorted, now you can see the negotiation occur. That was what the needle was doing. All right, so far? To understand the negotiation a little bit better, right now, that sidewalk, okay, it's a scale, but I'll call it a sidewalk, has been bent downward, dented downward, distorted downward, it's all the same idea. Just the right amount so that it pushes up with a force, pushes up on the wagon, with a force that's exactly equal to the wagon's weight. So the wagon experiences two forces, its weight down, force from the sidewalk up, that exactly sum to zero. They're equal in amount, opposite in direction, they sum to zero. Net force zero, is that questions? Therefore, it's not accelerating. Whenever the, the wagon, however, is above, okay, I should, I'll name this point again, it's, this is equilibrium. Equilibrium is when the, the system is experiencing zero net force. Whenever it's above equilibrium, which, what, is, does it have a net force? You tell me. Above, above equilibrium and not being held by me. Is there a net force? Hands up if you think yes. Hands up if you think no. Okay, the vast majority of the voters, again, it's, it's well, we're better than primary season. Um, the vast majority of voters are that yes, it has a net force, and that's true. It does have a net force, because when it's not denting the, the sidewalk enough, the sidewalk isn't supporting it enough. Its weight is bigger. The support's dinky. In fact, the support's zero now. So the net force on it is downward. So the bottom line is, whenever the wagon is above equilibrium, it's accelerating downward. You okay with that? Qu ask me questions if, you, if you're not. All right, whenever it's below equilibrium, denting the sidewalk extra specially much, show me with your hands in which direction it accelerates. Okay, we're getting the majority upward. That means the net force is upward, right? Net force causes acceleration, so, so it is upward, okay? So whenever the wagon is below equilibrium, denting too much, its acceleration's upward. Whenever it's above equilibrium, its acceleration's downward. You okay with that idea? That means it's, it's it, in effect, it always seeks equilibrium. If it's above equilibrium, it's, it's going to accelerate downward, and sooner or later, it's going to be heading downward. Not immediately, because remember, acceleration is the change in velocity, it's not velocity itself. So when the, when, the, when the wagon is above equilibrium, its velocity is evolving to go back down, back down toward equilibrium. And whenever it's below equilibrium, its velocity is, is evolving to head up. And so that's where the, that's ultimately why it bounces. It keeps trying to go to equilibrium. It keeps accelerating back toward equilibrium. The reason it doesn't stop the first time when it reaches equilibrium is because of what familiar concept? You tell me. Class, class. Heart, you know, I, I should memorize that, that, that section of uh, Ferris Bueller's Stay Off. You know this one? Um, Stein. With, uh, anyway, Ben Stein is there giving a spontaneous lecture on political economics or something. Anyhow. Um, nah, it doesn't matter. Uh, th so <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, class over. <laughs> yeah, it's the middle of the weekend anyway. I learned that years ago. Weekend starts Thursday night. So, <laughs> what can I 
I say. I, I did arrive here after they got rid of Saturday classes. So I'm not that ancient. Anyway, so, so whenever this is above equilibrium, it's accelerating downward. Whenever it's below equilibrium, it's accelerating upward. The, the, my question was, why doesn't it stop the first time it reaches equilibrium? When I first drop it on here, why doesn't it, I'm going to have to animate this, you know, human animation. Here we go. Why doesn't it go zoop to equilibrium? Stop. Why doesn't it stop there? Inertia. Exactly. Up until that point, as it descended, it has always been accelerating downward because it's above equilibrium, which means it was heading downward. That, that's that's a first observation. And it's accelerating downward. It's speeding up the whole way until it reaches that equilibrium point. Can you follow this? If you don't, ask me. That, fir that first descent, when you drop into, a, into the safety net after missing the, tramp, uh, the uh, trapeze. Ah, you're in free fall, free fall, free fall. Hit the, mat, the net. It begins to push up on you more and more and more. You reach equilibrium, but you are picking up downward speed the whole way. And when you hit equilibrium, you're heading downward. Your velocity's big, downward. And at equilibrium, you are, for the first time, at zero net force, and therefore are inertial. You're coasting, but you're coasting down. And you go right through equilibrium, I, I, I always call it overshooting, even though it's in the downward direction. And you go deep into the net. In this case, the wagon goes deep into the sidewalk. Once it gets below equilibrium, it's accelerating upward. So it, it slows to a stop. It was heading downward, accelerating upward. That's slowing down. It slows down, reaches a bottom, and then it continues to, to accelerate upward until it passes through equilibrium again. It goes right through equilibrium a second time and back and forth. Questions about that, that, that back and forth motion about equilibrium? Yeah. Yes, whenever it's below equilibrium, it's accelerating upward. So let me just give us an equilibrium, and I'll, and I'll animate this. I'll, I'll be the wagon, and here's actually Here's, here's the top of the table, just, just to give us a point to, to work, work with. So here's wagon coming down. D this whole time, it's accelerating downward, because the only thing it's experiencing is its weight. It then begins to touch the table for the first time, and its acceleration gets a little weaker, a little weaker, a little weaker, but it's, but it's still picking up speed in the downward direction. Right here, suddenly, no force, no acceleration. I mean, no net force, no acceleration. But it's heading downward still. It overshoots, and now it's accelerating upward. It slows to a stop, and then it comes back up. It's accelerating less and less and less and less and less. Whoa, now it's accelerating downward. More and more and more. It, it may even lift off the table again, and then it comes back down. And then it settles. Victor? Why is an equilibrium right on the surface of the table? Why is it down below? Well, this is, first of all, it's a, it's a blown up view. But right when you first touch the surface, you know, just touching the floor, I'm not denting it enough to summon a force big enough to support my weight. It's just a little force that shows up initially. And that's true with the, of the, the wagon, the ball, whatever. First touching the sidewalk, there's not enough dent, therefore not enough push. And so a small support force shows up, but not enough to actually uh, cancel the weight. Other questions? So it's something that the great many of you have done is go out in the middle of, of the bridge out here, this uh, McCormick Road Bridge. Or isn't it still the standard when you're on a tour thing to have everybody go jump, 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 and then and feel the whole bridge bounce? Right? If you're bouncing, first of all, around equilibrium, I, you know, I've asked. You have problems about this bridge for, for forever. Um, th that bouncing motion, whenever, normally it's at equilibrium. When, when you're standing there, it's, it's at equilibrium. But if you get it moving up and down, you can get it to go below equilibrium, in which case you're accelerating upward, or above equilibrium, in which case you're accelerating downward. And you keep passing through equilibrium, traveling fast, coast right through, come out the other side, accelerate 
to a stop and then pick up speed and then go back through again. So I mean, you can make that as a homework assignment, go and bounce on the bridge. All right? Yeah. So, so the question is, is equilibrium like a position? And, and it is. E the equilibrium position, actually, the word equilibrium shows up multiple places in physics. And we'll encounter at least one other type of equilibrium later, like thermal equilibrium. But this is a mechanical equilibrium. And it's, it's, a, it's a position. It's a, and what it is, is it's the, the position at which the net force is zero. So in, in the case of, a, of like a, a wagon on a sidewalk, the equilibrium position is net force zero. When the, when the sidewalk is perfectly supporting the wagon. And if you're above it or below it, net force isn't zero anymore. The dent's wrong. It, 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 if you're below equilibrium, is the net force negative? It, the, the negative and the positive are all shorthand for, for directions. So rather than try to say positive or negative, I'm more comfortable and, and probably more, it's more enlightening to, to give you a direction. So when you're below equilibrium, the net force is upward, back toward the equilibrium. And this is basically, is this universally true with springs? It, it's pretty nearly universally true if it's not perfectly true. That they always want to go back to equilibrium. They always fight to go back. And so that bridge is actually a spring. I mean, it's, it's a weird looking spring, but it's effectively one. And it's uh, very real stiff. When you take it below equilibrium, it fights to go back. OK, thanks. Other questions? So when you set down, you know, to leave the, these guys alone, when I set down the, the wagon, brief negotiation, it settles perfectly, right at equilibrium. There's a sort of a, a built-in feedback system. If it's too high, it's going to accelerate downward until it's the right height. If it's too low, it's going to accelerate upward until it's the right height. It's going to work its way to, to settle. We'll talk about other issues. Uh, the, you know, the settling process involves getting rid of something in, important and interesting, which is known as energy, and is a topic I will get to today. You know, what is energy? So one thing I've been glossing over, I talked about the forces that the sidewalk exerts on the, on the wagon and the forces the wagon exerts on the sidewalk. I need to say, say two cents or more about those two different forces, force of wagon on table, or sidewalk, and sidewalk on wagon. So the question to, to, to sort of get into this, here's what here is. If you push on a friend or a former friend, is there any case in which your friend will not push back on you? You OK with the question? It, it, it being the middle of the weekend, some of your friends might be asleep. If they're asleep, can they not push back? Anything? How many think that, yes, there are cases in which your friend will not push back when you're pushing on them? How about no, there is no case? Yay, you're right. There is no case. They have no choice. If you push on them, they will push back for sure. And this observation, and, and it's a quantitative observation, is called Newton's third law. It says that whenever one object pushes on a second object, so, so whenever I exert a force on this table, regardless of how strong I, my push is or what direction my push is, the other object, in this case the table, will push back on me exactly as equally hard, but in exactly the opposite direction. So if I push down on the table, it will push up on me equally hard. If I push away from you on the table, it will push toward you on me equally hard, and so on. And it's an observation in our universe. It is so deeply rooted in how the universe works that, that well, people, I would say people have looked for violations of this, but, but, but it would just completely destroy our understanding of physics if it were wrong. It just, it has to be that way. And um, so, so it's, a, it's, it's just known to be true by observation, but long, you know, a, a, a quintillion uh, such observations at this point we're pretty well convinced. Yeah, it's right. Okay, questions about that idea to be just, just in itself. And I just want to anticipate the order in which. So 
to, uh, okay, I, I'll go ahead to the next question, part of this question here. <clears throat> if you push on a friend who is moving away from you, so, so you're pushing, they're moving away, how will the force you exert on your friend compare to the force your friend exerts on you? You okay the question? Three choices. You push harder, your friend pushes harder, or they're equal in amount. The, the word magnitude is the formal name for an amount of a force, or amount of whatever uh, physical quantity. Uh, it's for, for vector quantities, which consist of an amount and a direction, the formal name for the amount is magnitude. I use it sometimes, but not very often. Okay, back to this question. Who pushes harder, or is it the same? You okay with the question? How many think you push harder? How many think your friend pushes harder? How many think that you push equal in amount? Man, you guys can teach the class. You're right. And it's, the reason I bring this one up is because this one's counterintuitive. I know it, it showed up in some of the questions that, you, that many of you have encountered on, on the, the website. So you may have already sort of been forewarned of this. But this one, this one can I have two of you to come down and demonstrate this? Allie and, and Mary Royal, come on. OK. So this time, one of you gets to ride in the wagon. But before, before, before one of you rides in the wagon, first, let's show you the Newton's, Newton's third law is true to begin with. So we've got two spring scales. Hold them, each of you hold them so that the, everybody else can see the, see the dial and face each other, and push top to top. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to basically measure each other's forces and see whether there's any, any way in which you can push on each other, wiggle around, whatever you like, where, the, where the, the pushes aren't equal, where Mary Royal's push on Allie isn't equal to Allie's push on Mary Royal. And as you guys can see, those, those needles are tracking exactly together, right? I'd have to, like, cheat with video to, to, to make that not work. OK, so, no, so nothing you can do. So now the question is, one of you gets, gets to ride in the, in the, in the wagon. OK, we still need the scales. Okay. And, and now, as, as, as Allie heads toward you or away from you, let's see whether, you, whether we can get the, the, the readings to be to be off, you, you okay in there? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, you want to sit down, actually? Okay, oh, there. Okay. All right. So now, as, as she's going away, and we we have a question. I'm not good at steering here. Try, try again as she's coming toward you. Right. You can't. There's nothing you guys can do. If if you lose contact, the forces get small, but but nothing you can do to, to avoid it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> we, I, in the years past, I've done it with these guys. And you'll notice right there in red print, do you see what it says? Do not stand. Yeah, we violate that every time. And it's precarious. OK, so the point of all the fun games is, as, as counterintuitive as it may be, that when people are moving or even accelerating and they're pushing on each other, their forces on each other will always be equal and opposite, regardless of the motion. If, if, if something's coming at you, uh, I don't want to make it a car, it's getting kind of brutal. But, but you know, car's coming at you, you try to stop it. Okay, you're Superman. There, good. You bring it to a stop. Even though it's coming at you, the force you exert on the car, and the force the car exerts on you, they're equal in amount in opposite direction. If, on the other hand, you push it forward and get it going, still, still true. And really believing this in your gut will take, for many of you, some, some thinking through it. I have had instructors for this class elsewhere, people who teach how things work uh, at other institutions. Uh, have, you have these conversations with them often by email, and, they'll, and it will come up that, that they don't actually buy in to, to Newton. I'm thinking one case in particular uh, where the instructor did not buy into Newton's third law. Uh, the instructor thought it applied when objects are at rest, but if one of them was accelerating, it wasn't true anymore. And ah, <laughs> as, as, as kindly as I could, I said, no, actually, it's still true. All right? Yeah. So 
if you're a regular person, person pushing on a car, and it's gonna, it's, it's gonna, you're, you're going to, to have some problems. You're gonna be traveling backwards in one form or another. That's true. But still, the force you exert on it will be the same equal amount but opposite of the force it exerts on you. The issue, of course, is that you have very small mass. So that significant force exerted on you causes you to accelerate rather rapidly. On the other hand, your, your force on, on, the, on this massive car, unless it's like a smart car, um, is going to cause it to accelerate not very much. So th this is the, the encounters. Let's get it out of your bug. Right? You've all seen this happen. It's much worse for the bug than for the car. But the two objects exerted equal forces on each other during the impact. It's just the bug did all the, you know, the vast majority of the accelerating and travels from then on with the car until you go to a car wash. Yeah? Yeah, the question is, is when you throw a ball, and, you, and you, you're, you're exerting a forward force on it to make it accelerate and pick up speed and head off, does it exert a force back on you? And the answer is yes, exactly equal in amount to the force you exert on it. You can feel that force. Uh, you feel it much more when it's a shot put than when it's a, 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 a little ball. But it's there, OK? And it is exactly equal and exactly opposite amount. And same when you catch it. Those forces always show up. They, they always show up in pairs. And so, I, so I, I'll, I'll name these. These forces that object A exerts on B and B on A, that is a pair of forces. I call it a Newton's third law pair. Each object experiences only one of those two forces. So, th so one, one of these ob observations about Newton's third law pairs, they have to be equal and opposite because they're object A and object B and B on A. Second observation about it is they're always on two different objects. And each object, therefore, is subject to only one of them. And there is no cancellation that ever occurs because of the Newton's third law pair. So when, for example, Allie and Mary Royal were pushing on each other with the scales, they were still accelerating in various ways. I mean, one thing we didn't do was just, let, let, you know, I could let go of the wagon. And, and when Mary Royal pushed on Allie, of course, Allie pushes back on Mary Royal, Allie would have accelerated. Off she'd go. Right? into the wall, yeah, we can run into real troubles. But, but the point of this part of the, of the harangue is that Newton's third law brings up two forces that are equal and opposite. And there's this temptation to say, force to the left, force to the right, they must cancel. So nothing happens. It's sure tempting to go that direction. And the reality is, they never cancel. Why? Because they never act on the same object. If I push. Yeah, I can do this without, well, I'll live dangerously. Ha! I'll, I'll flaunt the law here. So I'm going to push on the table to the right. The table, in turn, is going to push on me to the left. It can't help it. Nobody taught it how to push me to the left. I, I, here we go. Okay. So I push it, and I accelerate it. <laughs> I'm back. So, so it, you know, it's fun. Um, so I pushed it to the right. It, it had to push me to the left. I experienced only one of those forces. And therefore, it being the only force that mattered, I've got, yeah, I've got weight down. There's a support force up. But those cancel, and they're not important. The only horizontal force I experienced was the table's push to the left, and off I went. I just picked up speed, as in accelerating, to the left, and off I went. Is that okay? So be aware of the temptation to think Newton's, excuse me, th Newton's third law pairs cancel. They never do. And it's really tempting. So, you know, two weeks from now, someone will, it'll keep coming up. It's, so this is my misconception alert. Danger, danger. Uh, the forces of two objects exert on one another, they do have to be equal and opposite, but, they, but that pair is, each force is exerted on a different object. OK? It's in the book, too. It has a dangerous, dangerous thing. OK, where? All right. Yeah. Uh, what if I, if I push the table with the same weight or the same mass as me? First off, mass is not a force. So you don't 
you don't exert a mass on something. Mass is your resistance to acceleration. So that isn't something you, you, you exert on anything. Weight is a special force. It's the force on you due to the Earth's gravity. So it affects only you. You, don't, you can't exert literally your weight on something else. You can push on something else. It happens to be a support force because it comes from the contact of your hand. You can also exert frictional forces, which we'll come to soon. Uh, and so, the, so a question might be, what happens if I horizontally, it's boring because weight isn't horizontal, but if I push uh, the floor, okay, I'm going to exert a force on the floor that's equal in amount to my weight in the same direction. Or it's, in fact, it's completely equal to my, my weight. It's not literally my weight. But it's, it's this, so I'm, I'm going to do it right now. I'm doing it. You know, oh yeah, I'll make it very dramatic. Ooh, drum roll. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and how do I know that I'm exerting a force exactly equal to my weight on the ground? Well, it's really, it's actually a, 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 a series of logical thoughts. Alas, it's kind of long. I'm evidently not accelerating, right? So I must be experiencing an upward force that is equal to, in amount to my weight, but upward. Therefore, my weight, which is really there, and downward is being canceled by an upward push. So far, so good? That force upward on me is being exerted by the floor. Why? Because well, there's nothing else doing it. Neglect air. Um, so the floor is evidently exerting an upward force on me that is equal in amount to my weight. Well, if that's true, you know, that is true, then there's a Newton's third law pair associated with that force. Not only is the floor pushing me upward with a force equal in amount to my weight, but I must be pushing downward on the floor with a force equal in amount to my weight. And I am. So I'm exerting a downward support force on the floor that's equal in amount to my weight right now. And the whole logical process involves the fact that I'm not accelerating. If I were accelerating, the forces that, that the floor and I push up, exert on each other don't have to have much to do with my weight anymore like this, right? During that jump, I just decided to push extra hard on the floor, much harder than my weight. The floor couldn't help but push up on me with a force much harder than my weight, which completely overwhelmed my weight. The net force on me was upward, and up I accelerated. So that's what you do when you jump, right? And do, do any of you have bathroom scales old enough to read continuously? and show you what happens when you jump on them? Any of you done this? The, this, you know, this is where technology rules ruins all the fun. You know, as a, as a little kid, when I remember weighing like 50 pounds or something like that, and you go on the bathroom scale which says, you know, maximum weight 300 pounds, and it has a dial that reads, and you just would jump up and down on it, and the scale's going, woo, 300 pounds, woo, 300 pounds, and it's real. There are moments during that process where I'm pushing down with more than 300 pounds of force on the scale, and it's pushing up on me as it reports with more than 300 pounds of force. The consequence to me is I accelerate upward. Okay? Fooey on all the scale manufacturers. Yeah? You're right. When I'm talking about a net force, or it's, it's on, on a single object, not on the other objects involved. So when I'm pushing on the table, included in, that, in that, that net, that sum, is the table's force on me, the gravity's force on me, and the uh, cart's force on me. Always on me. What I exert on the table is the table's business. It doesn't count. That's something else. Right? It's like net income. When you go, net income, your, your income is usually someone else's loss, right? Or their payment. So you don't count the money, the, the loss of money for them. You only count the, the gain of money for you. Yeah. If the table had a very small mass and I pushed on it, wouldn't the table accelerate? And the answer is yes. That's right. The reason the table doesn't accelerate is because not only does it have a huge mass, but it's attached to the whole Earth. So when I push on it, it is accelerating 
away from me. I'm accelerating one way, it's accelerating the other way in response to my force on it. But it's mass. The, the effective mass of the table is so huge, it's just unnoticeable. But if I choose a smaller table, like this, you know, I'm, I'm barely moving away here. It has a smaller mass than I do, so it, did, it, it accelerated much more than I did. Is that okay? And to go back to one of these grand questions I remember having as a kid was, you know, Dad, Dad, if I, if I jump like this, does the Earth actually change? You know, does it actually affect the Earth? And the answer is yes, it does. When I push on the Earth like that, super hard down, well, it pushes back on me super hard up, and I accelerate upward. But my push down on it affects the Earth. It accelerates you know, down. Uh, because its mass is rather large, that's hard to notice. But it's, it's real. It's there. Um, there's certainly instruments. In the, for, well, the whole Earth is, is too complicated in structure. It actually, there, there are all kinds of ripples that happen. But there are instruments in this, in this building that, that can detect that kind of, those tiny accelerations. They're, it's not, not hard. The whole Earth, yeah, that's hard. The building, not so hard. Other questions? All right. Well, I better get to, to ramps a little bit here. It's time. We, we've done already busting water balloons. <coughs> and, and what happens, so what happens, we, everything up until now has been, been uh, horizontal. For, you know. What happens if we tilt the, the sidewalk? So now, if I put the sidewalk here, and, and tilt, the tilted sidewalk, and I put the wagon on it, and I let go, what happens? Well, depending on how well I steer, the wagon, it accelerates down the ramp. Right? It starts at rest, and it goes faster and faster. It's accelerating. It's evidently experiencing a force down the ramp uh, it's a gentle force compared to the full weight of the wagon. But it's enough to make the wagon go faster and faster and faster. And it also depends on the steepness of the ramp. Uh, this, if I go to a, if I make it a barely ramp, pick random things. My lab is full of random things that had to serve the purpose for a minute and then get left behind. Whoa. It, you know, it's imperfections here are managing to stop this guy from accelerating. It's a little too shallow, but, but, but it's a very gentle downhill force. Where does this come from? So now I've got to stop this, otherwise it'll fall. If you remember, support forces always act perpendicular to the surfaces that exert them. And since the ramp's top surface isn't exactly horizontal, the ramp's support force isn't exactly vertical. It's up at an angle. And the angle is in the down is toward the downhill direction. And the negotiation process between the wagon and the, and the ramp's surface still occurs, and they still manage to make sure that neither one en either enters or or leaves the surface. So the wagon the wagon sitting on the ramp I don't know tip it up again. The wagon sitting on the ramp neither lifts off the ramp nor drills into it. It's exactly on the surface because of that negotiation process. And if you then look at the, the, the wagon, with, if my hand was, when my hand lets go, the wagon is experiencing two forces. Its weight straight down, the definition of vertically downward, and the ramp's support force up and at an angle. They can't cancel. You can't cancel a downward force with an up and an angle force, no matter what the strength of that force is. And so the fact that those forces are at slightly different angles and that the wagon, by, by virtue of the negotiation, has to stay right on the surface of the ramp means that the, the net force the wagon experiences, again with my hand out of the way, points exactly along the ramp. And so this is, this is fun in games with, with geometry and angles and, and uh, it's not worth doing in great, any, any detail. But the, there is a, a residual force left over from weight down, support force up at an angle. The residual force is right down the ramp and weak. And I call it the ramp force. And it is the force that causes that wagon to speed up as it goes down the hill. It's, 
pushing directly downhill and it goes faster and faster. And the steeper the ramp is, the worse the cancellation is between the, the, the support force that is now getting more and more tilted and weight and the bigger the ramp force. So the, ramp, the steeper the ramp is, the stronger that ramp force becomes. Until when the ramp is completely steep, as in <laughs> vertical, the ramp force is the full acceleration, is the full, full force to gravity, the weight of the wagon. It goes smoothly. I mean, the, 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 these are the kind of things that, yeah, you know, I mean, physicists, instead of going out on parties on Thursday night, are there going, wow, it goes completely smoothly from zero force, no acceleration, through larger and larger accelerations to the acceleration to gravity. Wow, is that cool or what? Okay. Sorry, it's, it makes us nerds sometimes. Yeah. Is, is there a, mag a relationship between the magnitude of the weight and the support force? Yes, the, 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 the support force is going is to turn out to be exactly proportional to the weight, but the constant of proportionality is going to be, has to do with the, tilt, with the tip of the weight, tip of the, the angle of the ramp. So if you double the weight, you put two wagons on, or you put a kid in the wagon, the support force will scale up according to the, the increase in weight. Uh, instantly, the acceleration down, down one of these ramps is, it, it has to do with the ramp force and uh, it, the acceleration down the ramp is the ramp force divided by the object's mass. So if you increase the object's mass, that by itself would slow the acceleration. More mass is more resistance to acceleration. However, the weight goes up. So therefore, the ramp force goes up. And so it exactly compensates. So all things roll down a ramp at the same rate, just as they fall at the same rate. It scales perfectly. So if you have two, two, two grocery carts uh, at the grocery store, and there's a, there happens to be a nice hill, and one of, the, one of the grocery carts is full, and one of them's empty, and you let go of them, they both go down and hit the parked cars at the, you know, at the same time. The case I'm thinking of is a wheelchair that with my, my son sitting in a wheelchair while his, his cousin pushed him onto a hill. They were both like seven or something like that. And the downhill acceleration was rather dramatic. Uh, my son survived. <laughs> you know, not to be repeated. All right? So, so you okay with uh, the idea that there's a ramp force that shows up when, when you have a tilted surface? Um, where I want to go with this now, rather than <coughs> majoring in ramps, uh, is, is a more interesting observation, one of the, well, the most important observations of ramps, is that, that if you look at the force necessary to prevent the object from rolling down the hill, this will probably do it. Right? If I let go of this, of course, it goes down the hill, it accelerates down. I can stop that downhill acceleration by pulling uphill with a force that's equal in amount, of course I use the wrong end of the scale, by exerting an uphill force that's equal in amount. So a seven newton, approximately seven newton uphill force manages to balance the downhill ramp force, which is evidently also seven newtons. And now this wagon can uh, have zero net force, which means, interestingly enough, that it, not that it's motionless necessarily, but that it travels at constant velocity. Its velocity right now is zero, but let me get it started. There we go. And now I'm still pulling with seven, approximately, but briefly, it was, it was coasting uphill, because I managed to, to, as long as I cancel the downhill weight force, downhill ramp force, the net force on it is zero. And it's inertial, it can be going uphill, it can be going downhill, or it can be motionless. That, I any of those possibilities. As I get interested in trying to convey the right pieces, let's see. So, so here, here's an observation: taking something up a ramp. You're, you've got a grocery cart. You're at the base, the bottom of the ramp. You want to get to the top of the ramp. You get on the ramp. Let, let, let's not worry about the transition from flat to on the ramp. You're on the ramp, holding the ra the the cart from rolling downhill at the bottom. So you're balancing the ramp force. To get started up the ramp, to actually make progress, you have to push, push a little extra hard to start the uphill acceleration. You have to more than compensate for the downhill ramp force. So you give it a, an extra big push at first to get it started. 
Once it's moving and you're happy with its motion, you can back off and simply push hard enough to cancel the downhill ramp force and let it coast, because it will. It will continue up the, up the ramp now at constant velocity. You okay with this? Or questions? At the top, then, you want to bring it to, re to a stop again. Now you under support it. You push up on it a little, not as strongly as the ramp force pulls down on it. And so it slows to a stop. So that's the whole story of going from the bottom of the ramp to the top. You push a little extra hard at first, then you let it coast, then you push a little extra weak at the top and, and let it come to a stop. All right, so why do we use ramps? Well, it's because if you've got a cart full of groceries and it's Thursday afternoon and the groceries are, are by, by and large liquid and very heavy, then going straight up to the second floor of your apartment is, on a, in a ladder is going to be difficult, too much weight to support. To go to constant velocity up the ladder, you have to, you have to provide an upper, uphill force that completely supports the weight of the, of the, the beverages and not going to work. So you go up the ramp. The cost of going up the ramp, you, it, it takes only a gentle force to balance the downhill, the downhill ramp force. But you have to go along a very long ramp to get to the second floor. It's now, instead of being a vertical ladder, it's this long, tapered thing. Is there anything about that trip that, that, that's the same whether you go up the ladder or whether you go up the ramp? And the answer is yes. And it, come, it brings us to here at the end of the time. I'll, I'll give you the introduction to this. And then I'll, I'll, I'll do it in better, in better uh, form on, on Monday. But the thing that's the same, whether you go to the second floor straight up the ladder, or whether you go along the ramp to the second floor, is the amount of energy that you invest in the stuff you're lifting. What's energy? So energy is the first of what will be three, I think three, we've got three conserved quantities of nature to talk about this semester. They're, these are very, uh, you know, they're rare, precious quantities in nature. What a, what a conserved quantity is, is a physical quantity, first off, so it, it typically has an amount and uh, units. And furthermore, some of them have direction to them, but this one does not. This one known as energy does not have a direction. It's purely an amount uh, with units. Conserved quantities are, are quantities that can either be created or destroyed. There's a fixed amount of them, so basically in the universe. And it's a little bit of an overstatement, but a fixed amount of them. And to change your portion of that quantity, you can only do it by giving it to something else. And so my favorite analogy for this is money. Money in a normal, at least in a local economy, is a conserved quantity, assuming nobody's printing the stuff in their basement and no one you know, burns it. it. It moves around, but the net amount of, of, of money in the community is constant, unless, of course, some of it's crossing the border, coming in or out. But, but it, it moves from one place to the other. So if you want your money to increase, you got to get it from someone else. They have to pass it to you. The same thing is true of energy. Energy, I call it the conserved quantity of doing. It allows things to happen. And to have more energy, to have more ability to do things, you have to get the energy from something else. Uh, it can come in a, in a vast number of possible ways uh, to get to you, but it comes mechanically, it arrives always by the same uh, approximate mechanism, which is known as work. To have energy come to you, you have to have something do work on you, give you, this is physics work. Um, it has nothing to do with nine to five. Uh, similarly, if you want to give energy to something else, you have to do work on it. And how do you do work? So I'll give you the preview of how you do work. You do work on something by, by way of a very specific recipe. You have to do work on this bowling ball. I have to push on it first. So I must exert a force on it. And it, that, the bowling ball must move a distance in the direction of my push, my force. So right now, I am pushing up on the bowling ball. You know this from experience, right? You know that it's, I'm, I'm pushing up. And if I raise the bowling ball like this, I've, I've fulfilled the requirements of doing work. 
I have pushed up on it. It moved a distance in the direction of my push, namely up. So I gave it energy. I did work on it. It has now the ability to do things that it, it couldn't do before. It's more threatening, right, to you guys? Than it, wow, than it used to be. It's more threatening to me. And so I've invested in it the ability to do things. Similarly, if I, if I throw it, well, I'm not going to throw it. Same thing with a baseball. When you throw a baseball, you know, why, why the big wind up and the long throw? Because you push it forward and it moves forward. You do work on it. So in the act of throwing the ball and allowing it to go do things like dent the wall, you do work on it. Just to give it full, full, full uh, story. When I lower the ball, so I did work on it. Now, when I lower it, I'm pushing up. It's moving opposite my force. I'm doing a negative amount of work on it, less than none, which actually reduces its energy. So this is positive energy transferred to it. This is negative. And it's now, it's now able to do less than it could before. Less still. Same with the ball. When you throw it up to speed, you do work on it, invest energy into it. When you catch it, you take energy out of it. You push it away from you as it comes toward you. You suck the energy out of it. So we'll look at the, you know, okay, with, with that preview then, we'll look at the investment of energy in the act of, of lifting something straight up to the second floor versus along the ramp to second floor. It turns out the energy investment's the same either way. See you on Monday.